Hey, welcome and thanks for joining me as we continue on this journey to the cross of Christ. And as we make that journey, yes, there is mystery, there's anticipation, there's excitement, there is wonder, there is sorrow, there is grief, and then there is uh, the joy of Resurrection Sunday, Easter, where we celebrate the victorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which declares uh, publicly and powerfully uh, that sin has been paid for on the cross because death is no more. Death is defeated. You cannot hold him, cannot hold you and me if we are believers in Christ Jesus. So looking at that, the stage that we're at on this journey, uh, the, the place where we are, is the, the institution of the Lord's Supper. And there's questions about that um, as to when exactly during this Passover celebration that Jesus has with his disciples, when exactly that takes place. Has the meal already been eaten? Um, is it during the meal? At what point during the meal? Some people take the, the cup that he takes as the cup of blessing. Perhaps it is. There's really no way to know for sure. I know that people try to nail it down, this Passover Haggadah, but I've looked at it and looked at it and looked at it for many years, and I don't know that you can say definitively, this is when this is, this is when that is, this is what occurred. You have at least 11 I don't know that Judas gave testimony. You have at least 11 who gave testimony to what Jesus said, what was happening, when it happened, what was going on. Um, certainly there is more uh, things talked about in John. John doesn't even cover the institution of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the, the, the sayings of the breaking of the bread, the giving the, 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 the cup, that kind of thing. You do have a couple of accounts in, in Luke and Paul who gives an account that he got. Uh, you also have uh, Mark and Matthew. Um, and Matthew is the one we're looking at, chapter 26. Uh, and really the institution of the Lord's Supper begins in verse 26, uh, verses 26 and 27. And I suppose it goes, goes on into uh, verse 29. Um, but I'm linking that with, with going out singing a hymn. And so as we look at this, you know, I don't have all of the nailed down answers to everything it, when it took place. Was it a Passover? Yes. Um, obviously it was. We did the timeline yesterday. It's obviously a Passover. Um, what, what does that mean? That, that Why are people so excited about Passover? Why are so many pilgrims going to Passover? Well, one, it, it was the most celebrated of the three uh, pilgrim festivals that were done in Israel, the Israelites had to appear in Jerusalem at the temple. And Passover was a huge celebration, thousands upon thousands of people coming. Uh, the the, the, the um, area of Jerusalem, Jerusalem proper, Greater Jerusalem, uh, had to be expanded. Uh, the city limits had to be expanded. Bethany was the farthest it went up to the shoulder of the Mount of Olives. And there, 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 during this time, of course, what it celebrates is God's deliverance of Israel and taking them to himself to be a people, uh, God's deliverance of his people from slavery, bondage in Egypt. And the Passover name comes from the death angel passed over them because of the blood of the Passover lamb. They were sealed uh, in the blood, by the blood, uh, in their homes. And so that, of course, looking back from the perspective of the cross and Easter, that we see that this blood and this bread that is broken. And of course, the, the, the unleavened bread, the, the blood of the lamb that is poured out, that is spread across the doorposts and lintels of the house uh, so that they are sealed in the blood and, and they are protected from the judgment of God uh, on the wickedness of, of Egypt and not turning uh, to him and, and not repenting and not turning to him. So uh, the, the death angel comes over Egypt and uh, all the firstborn are killed. And so it is, a, it is a celebration of that deliverance. It's also a celebration of coming into the promised land of God, leading them into that promised land. And so there's a lot tied up to that. There's the expectation of one who would come like Moses, who would be a deliverer, who would bring them 
uh, that that promise that, that Moses says that God will raise up one like me who will you listen to him, you do what he says, that kind of thing. And we've already seen that that's what uh, when the triumphal entry, so-called triumphal entry, uh, takes place. That that's the the answer that is given. Who is who is this guy? Who 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 is he really? Well, he's the prophet. He's the one, uh, the one promised the Messiah, the prophet my, that Moses spoke of. Uh, the deliverer that God has promised to bring, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. So all of that is tied up in this Passover, and not in this particular Passover, but in the Passover expectations, certainly of the second temple period, uh, which we're in with the first century uh, in the life of Jesus. So so as you have Passover, you and not only at Passover, you have a, a Specific words that are spoken by the head of the household, it would have been Jesus in this case. You have responses by the youngest, and that would have been John. Uh, you have a certain order that's supposed to take place when things are said. There are four cups of wine. There are certain blessings that are said for each one. Uh, there are certain blessings that are said, and all of that. So what Jesus deviates from all of that, if indeed it's during the Passover that he institutes the Lord's Supper, some would argue that it is after the Lord's Supper, I mean, it is after this meal that the Lord's Supper is instituted and that Judas doesn't participate in this meal. I don't think Judas participates in this meal. I think he leaves. Uh, it's clear as you, when you look at the other gospel accounts, Judas leaves, and clearly he had to leave before they left and went to, uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane. So, so clearly that's going on. Uh, so... That he that he's going to leave. So I, it's my personal belief that he leaves prior to the institution of the Lord's Supper. And so what we're looking at is, and it is quite poignant. Yesterday, we're, you're looking at is it is it I is it I the question rightly to ask before uh, taking the Lord's Supper? Uh, am I a betrayer? Am I am I a genuine disciple? Am I, am I is, is it me? Is there something in me that I don't know about, Lord? You know, and to be and that's what Paul says. We're going to examine ourselves before we come to the table of the Lord, and certainly that is true. And what we'll see today is, is that the, the table of the Lord is only for disciples, only for followers of Christ, only for believers. It's not for everyone uh, that is out there. It is for believers only, for those who have uh, who, who can rightly say, though I'm not perfect, I am a follower of Christ, I am a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe in him, I've trusted in his finished work on the cross, and, and then we can talk about taking the Lord's Supper. It's not... Uh, it, it is not to um, take it lightly, to, to be sure. It is, is it a joyful take? Yes, it is joyful, but it is also somber. Uh, we're to take it seriously. I think you can have joy in the midst of that seriousness, uh, but I think there, there must come sorrow and this, this self-examination, and I'm a sinner, this kind of thing. And that in, 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 as we look at this Lord's Supper, it, it's... It, it is amazing, though, when you think about the Lord's Supper, that in Jesus sitting down, in some sense, it is the sins. He says that, that my blood is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. It is sin that is put, putting Jesus on the cross. It is the sins of those disciples, even though they are followers of his, and even though they say, is it I? And, and their expectation is that he'll say no. Uh, their question is, is not a, a, a moot question. It is a, it's a, it's a valid question to ask. Am I, am I genuine? Is there anything in me that's not genuine? Am I, am I truly a follower of you? Have, have, have I forsaken everything to follow you? Am I a follower uh, of you, Lord Jesus? Are you my Lord? Are you my Savior? Are you my Master? You're, you're my King. Is that true? And so that must be asked as we take the Lord's Supper. And then uh, it, it's only for disciples. And so in that sense, I think that's why Judas has to have left prior to the institution of the Lord's Supper. Uh, so the question is, is it during the dipping of the carousel when you have the Hillel sandwich, as it was called, or, or is it when the Passover lamb has been done? Have we done all of the words from John and we've eaten the lamb and it's while they're eating the lamb that this takes place because Judas obviously leaves when they, have the, when they do the, the carousel on the unleavened bread with the bitter herbs. Uh, horseradish when that's mixed there the sweet and the bitter together and each one takes that um, and, and it's at that point that Judas leaves so he's not there for the institution of the Lord's Supper so obviously the Lord's Supper is not part of that is it while they're eating the lamb that that has taken place that Jesus does this where you get the third cup of blessing um, possibly because they go out after that singing a hymn which would be the last of the Hallel uh, 
Psalm 115 and through 118 would be the last of that. 113 through 118 is all of it that's sung during the observance of Passover, various times within it. Um, but oh, the point I was going to make is this, and I think this is a reality even for us today, is that in a very real sense, uh, it is the sin of those very disciples that he's going to have this meal with um, that is putting him on the cross. And in, in what we are to see is uh, we ourselves, as disciples, our sin is putting him on the cross, and yet he offers us this meal that represents salvation, that speaks of redemption and the purchase of God, uh, the redemption of God, the salvation of God, the rescue of God, however you want to term that. And so that is quite um, quite a statement to make in and of itself and something really to ponder upon uh, prior to our taking of the Lord's Supper, uh, the reality of the love of God in Jesus, the love of Jesus Christ for his followers, for his disciples, to do this for them and to sit down and have this meal knowing what's coming, knowing that one of them is betraying him, handing him over to the authorities, uh, and that he will not repent. Repentance has been offered. An opportunity to repent has been offered, and he's refused it. He's hardened his heart against Jesus and has gone out. And then you have Peter, who's going to become a, who's such a boisterous, big, strong Peter, and yet he's going to be reduced by a servant girl to a, 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 a cussing and blaspheming and and weeping uh, uh, foolish kind of man uh, not making a stand and, and all of the, the disciples are going to flee and going to run away in that moment and so uh, knowing that that's going to happen it's it, Jesus sits down with them and has this Lord's Supper and institutes this this is for them this is for us this is for all who would follow him who would believe in him who would trust in him as Lord and Savior. So let's take enough introduction. I'll probably take more time than I should, but let's look at these verses. Uh, Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. And while they were eating, and this is the second time, while they were eating, Jesus interrupts the meal. One, to let them know, I know that one of you is going to betray me. He doesn't specifically point out Judas, which is remarkable. Uh, there's leeway for Judas to save. There's leeway for Judas to repent, leeway for him to come to, to Jesus and say, I know you know what's going on, and I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And it, it could have been done. It could have been stopped. He could have repented, but he didn't. Uh, but Jesus never points a finger at him. Uh, the, the, the talk between Jesus and Judas is private, and uh, Judas knows that he knows, but he hardens his heart and doesn't repent. The second time is here. While they're eating, I think possibly eating the, the main meal, Judas has already gone. They're eating the main meal, which would have still been uh, uh, unleavened bread, the roasted lamb and herbs and so forth and, and other other vegetables, other fruits, other things that would have been there uh, as well. Jesus took some bread. He took artan, and that word in the Greek usually refers to a loaf of bread or a cake of bread. Of course, it's an unleavened loaf, an unleavened cake, whether it's round or long, it doesn't really matter. And he gave a blessing, a typical blessing of the bread, which would have been something like, uh, uh, blessed be you, O Lord, King of the universe, uh, who brings bread from the earth and something like that. And he broke it and gave it to the disciples. It is the, the breaking of this bread. It is the breaking uh, that's significant, that he broke it. And the language uh, indicates that he handed this to each one of them. Uh, and the breaking of the bread is significant because the bread represents his body, his life that is given to them. He broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Those, those were, this is my body. Wow, what a controversy that has caused throughout Christendom. But it's my belief that this is symbolic. It, it's more than symbolic. There is something that transpires. It is mysterious. Something that transpires within the taking of the Lord's Supper, the elements of the Lord's Supper, the bread, the cup, that transpires between uh, the Savior, the King of Kings, Messiah, Jesus, and his followers, and within that fellowship that is taken, that group, because it is a fellowship that is taken here, there is something that transpires there that is mysterious, the, the very real presence, that Jesus is present in that. I don't think it's actually his body. I don't think the cup is actually his blood. I think that's representative of the fact 
the reality that, of what he has done and that he is present with us. And also, as Paul says, that we're declaring his death until he comes. And we'll get to that tomorrow. But seeing what this bread signifies, not a single one who took that bread would have thought to themselves, oh, I'm actually eating his flesh. That's not what they would have thought. Um, I'm not sure what they thought. I'm sure there was confusion. What does he mean? This is my body. They still haven't taken in the idea that he's going to die on the cross. I'm sure uh, in some sense, Peter's like, no, um, your broken body, uh, th th that this represents, uh, uh, he broke it and gave it to the son and said, take, eat, this is my body. And you have to take it in sacrificial terms because that's supposed to be, it's tied with the cup, his blood. So his body, his life, his blood, all of this is, is covenant language, sacrificial language. It is death language. And Peter has already said, I don't want to hear that. You, you know, I'll stand with you. This is not going to happen. Um, the confusion of the other disciples. Well, well, what's he talking about? Um, in the midst of, and he's diverted from the typical Haggadah, the, the, the order of service for the Seder. Uh, this to take place. That's the, the order of service for, for the Passover meal, the Seder. And so so he's brokering that. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of misunderstanding. What is he talking about? What is he, what's, what's going on? Uh, but they didn't say, evidently nothing was recorded. For Matthew, the center of the focus of the Lord's Supper is Jesus Christ himself. He is the one who's giving. And I think that's the way it should be in our taking of the Lord's Supper. It is a taking what he is giving to us. It is not our giving something to him. It is receiving what he is giving to us. And it is representative of his death on the cross, uh, his, his life that is given for us, uh, and the blood that is shed for us. And so let's finish that. Um, each of the disciples are to take and eat it. So it is only believers, it is only disciples that can partake in this meal. I think that's vitally important too. This is my body. It is representative of his life, his life that is given as a ransom for you and for me, as a substitute for you and for me, as a, a taking our place on the cross so that sin can be dealt with. And, and it is only he that can deal with it. We can't. It's impossible. Israel couldn't do it. We can't do it. Only Jesus could do it because only he is the righteous representative of Israel, the son of God, the one who was promised who would come and be the means by which the world is rescued from sin and death. And God's wrath is poured out on sin uh, in his flesh, uh, it's not poured out on him as his son. It's poured out on sin in his flesh because the wages of sin is death. And, and death is the result of our rejecting God. It is the result of our denying God. It is the result of our sinfulness, our idolatry. And death is a result of that. And the only way to rescue us from death is to break this bond that sin has on us, and his death does that. His blood uh, is that of the new covenant. And so he took that. This is my body. It represents his life given on the cross. And secondly, and when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, and of course, the, the blessing that was given would have been something like, Blessed art thou, O Lord, uh, King of the universe, who brings, who brings forth wine, uh, the fruit of the vine. Um, and so he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. Is this a common cup? It certainly appears that way. Drink from it, all of you, each one of you, uh, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Um, this, is the, this is poured out, it, the direct reference to the blood of sacrificial lambs being poured out at the foot of the altar, uh, being drained there. The blood being drained, poured out, and then smeared on the doorpost and lintel of the houses of, of the Israelites in Egypt uh, so that they are safe and secure, uh, that they are sealed in and under the blood, and that we are sealed in and under the blood of Jesus Christ, this blood of this new covenant. The covenant is ratified in his blood and the shedding of his blood. Uh, there is forgiveness of sin because God has given the blood uh, to make atonement. And in this case, it is not just a covering of sin. It is the removal of sin in that uh, it, it, it is the shedding of blood that sin is taken care of, the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. And so he says, um, this cup is given the, the third cup of redemption, and there are four cups of wine that are done. I think it'd be interesting. Actually, the six, six, and seven is where you find this. This is four cups that are based on these four things that God says concerning Israel. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and one, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. 
Two, I will deliver you from their bondage. Three, I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Four, I will take you for my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So each must drink of it. It's the third one, the cup of redemption or the cup of blessing um, that Jesus, many believe that he takes. And I have no problem with that. The cup of redemption pointing to the fact that it is God through Jesus who is redeeming not only Israel, but his creation, rescuing it, buying it, restoring it uh, so that it can, it can be um, liberated from the bondage of sin and the dark powers that want to enslave. Uh, Egypt is a microcosm of what God is doing in the larger cosmos in rescuing all of creation and certainly rescuing humanity. And the blood of the covenant, of course, is the new covenant that he is talking about. And that forgiveness for many, why not the forgiveness of all? Isn't it the forgiveness of all? Doesn't he die for everyone? Yes, but not everyone receives that. Not everyone believes in Christ. And the forgiveness cannot be meted out to us, cannot be applied. The blood cannot be applied until we receive the grace of God, the offer of reconciliation, the offer of redemption, uh, so that it is for those who will receive it. It is for all those who will receive, but if you will not receive, then you cannot be saved. It is that simple. If you reject the only cure for sin that there is, then there is no cure for you, my friend, uh, and Jesus is that cure. But there are many passages that refer. Exodus 24, 8, of course, is the one that's primarily being talked about. Uh, and so Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. That is the red, this blood of the covenant. The blood is how covenants are ratified. And so there is a relationship. Covenant always has a relationship between, in this case, it's a, this is ready to covenant where it's a greater to the lesser. The, the lesser, the greater is making the covenant with the lesser because the lesser cannot make a covenant with the greater. And it's a relationship covenant. It's a covenant of blessing and a covenant of curse. If you do this, then I will do that. I will bless you. And so there is an expectation of a, of a relationship here uh, in this new covenant. So what is, that new cov what is that relationship like? Well, you have Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah that speak of these. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them from the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and in their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for you shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Ezekiel says much the same thing. It talks about a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone, and he will cause us to walk in his statutes because the Holy Spirit will dwell within us. Isaiah speaks, uh, Isaiah 53 actually goes back to Isaiah 52 and 53, kind of run together, Isaiah 53 um, 13 and following. Uh, if you're not familiar with Isaiah 53, surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. For all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And so it is the forgiveness of sin. It's for, for all of those who will receive it. It is the it is the accumulation of the end all of the Passover celebration. It is what the Passover looks forward to. It is the, the, the Passover is a microcosm of what God is going to do and has done in Jesus Christ on this cosmos scale. Uh, it's not just human beings that are being rescued. It's his entire creation that is being rescued. Hence, the new creation, the new heaven, the new earth. We are recreated. We are made new. And the Holy Spirit dwells in us and is making us like Christ. It doesn't happen overnight. Yes, we are saved immediately. But this becoming like Christ and growing into that, um, that, is a, that is a lifetime uh, journey. And uh, it is a continual discipling, learning, growing uh, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You know, when, when we examine ourselves, as C.S., not C.S. Lewis, but uh, N.T. Wright said, that's a well that, 
that neither he nor we want to look deeply into because of what we the reflection we might see there um, in that darkness that is not that is still a part of us and can flame up and flare up in any moment when when love should be in us and the love of God in us and sometimes that's not present. There's not forgiveness. There's not love, joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. But there's wickedness, there's meanness, there's ugliness, selfishness, bitterness, and things that, that get there. And yet Jesus calls his, his disciples. And this is for that forgiveness, his body, his blood that is shed for us. So when we observe the Lord's Supper, when we take that bread, when we take that cup, um, we are proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. We are saying there is victory in Jesus Christ. We are uh, saying that in him, in his life, in his blood, number one, his life is real food. And number two, it is as we receive that sacrifice unto ourselves that, that we are saved and our sins are forgiven. And it's all based in the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ expressed, my goodness, in what he is doing and going to the cross for you and for me and the, the glorious resurrection that, that we have. We'll talk more about this tomorrow, uh, and we'll look at his, their going out and his promise of seeing us again uh, and what this leads up to. So look forward to that. Hey, listen, God loves you. I pray that you know that. He gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, uh, to die upon a cross and to be resurrected. So you might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy indescribable right here and right now. And if you possess the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, then you also possess the shalom of God, the peace of God. And that is my prayer for you, that you are at peace and you know his shalom. That's my prayer. That is my hope. I pray that his blessing of shalom rest upon you always. Uh, till tomorrow, uh, God bless you. See you tomorrow.